This is CBC Here and Now. We're certainly disappointed that that we're losing this this route. We've been marketing the Dublin flight now since it uh, was initiated in 2013. You know, when the aircraft carriers put these flights on, we had to find a way to uh, to ensure the ridership is there for them to continue. Disappointment tonight that St. John's is losing its direct flight to Ireland. The big deal when it first took off four years ago, WestJet's flight to Dublin from St. John's grounded. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Well, the province has lost yet another bridge to Europe. Today, WestJet announced that it's cancelling its non-stop flight from St. John's to Dublin, which has been running every summer now since 2014. Here Now's Carolyn Stokes is standing by live at St. John's International Airport. Carolyn. Yes, Anthony, uh, that's right. Uh, yet another uh, direct flight from St. John's to Europe has been lost. You may recall last January, WestJet cancelled another nonstop flight from St. John's to London. Now that flight was moved to Halifax and now this Dublin Direct, well, that's going to move to Halifax too. WestJet says customer traffic on its flight just wasn't living up to expectation. I mean, for us, it was just really disappointing and it wasn't the only way to fly, but it was a very super convenient way to fly. That convenience has now turned a little tangly. Josh Jameson regularly used the direct summer flight to Dublin. His partner is Irish and losing the direct flight now puts a crimp in their annual family visits. We're certainly obviously going to continue um, going over to visit his family there with the same regularity that we always did and you know we'll certainly encourage them to come over and see us in our beautiful province um, with with all of the same gusto that gets a little bit more challenging when you're bouncing around from airport to airport and having to change planes and go through customs in Halifax as opposed to just landing conveniently in St. John's. This would have been part of an ad that we placed in a newspaper in Waterford. Destination St. John's has been targeting Ireland with marketing campaigns to promote tourism in this province. Part of the appeal was the direct access. We were getting there, you know, I think we were making good progress. So Halifax wins another round. Kathy Duke says maybe it's time for more proactive measures. Collectively, we all need to make air access a real priority. In other destinations, governments have become involved um, in, you know, subsidizing flights or supporting them in one way or another in the early years. The mayor of St. John's was also surprised by this announcement and agrees government should get involved. I do think that we need to uh, we need to work with the other levels of government and the airport authority on how we're going to be able to uh, uh, to get this uh, to get this back and and make it work. And of course, this is also bad news for the airport itself. After all, it is spending over $200 million to expand. It certainly doesn't want to see the number of flights shrink. But at least St. John still has one direct flight to Europe left. Air Canada still offers nonstop flight from St. John's to Heathrow. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. There's long been a void in the criminal justice system. What do you do with people who commit crimes but don't belong in jail? A new pilot project beginning next week is hoping to weed people out of the justice system, people whose crimes are directly linked to their addiction. Here and now's Arianna Kelland reports. If you're an offender coming up this escalator at provincial court, you're usually expecting a punishment. But if you're a severe addict, you may get a second chance. Crime, court, jail, repeat. It's a revolving door that plagues the justice system. It's one John Duggan has seen almost daily for decades. We frequently see somebody coming in with 10 and 12 charges of shoplifting, numerous meat cheeses, those sorts of things. We know it's not for personal use, but the background of the individual speaks to a drug addiction. They're stealing in order to support the habit. Starting next week, those people can go through a drug treatment court in St. John's. Instead of jail, they be offered court-monitored treatment, drug testing and other social services. But it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Crimes like these, ones that involve violence, aren't included in the plan. What we're hoping to accomplish is to stop the people, get them treatment before they become the individuals that are prone to commit an armed robbery because of their drug addiction. 
Three years ago, Duggan and other lawyers made a pitch to the justice minister for a solution to nonviolent drug fueled crimes, and he listened. I think you're going to see uh, a lowering of, uh, of crime committed. You're going to see people that are going to get treatment for the help that they need. It's going to be increased or uh, increase the. Uh, the number of people that are able to avail of this and, and decrease the pressure on the court system. The goal is to shorten the list and eventually move the project outside the overpass. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. She was driving and it fell to the side and she hit her head. She hit her head and oh, it's a parent's worst nightmare. More than a year after a 13-year-old girl was killed in a rollover crash on a side-by-side, -side, her mother is demanding changes. Just ahead, Ryan Cook has the story of Heidi Dunn's death and what her mom is seeking. And later on Here and Now... Our soup club began last February when I had some junior high students who were really interested in helping hungry people in St. John's. A home ec class at a St. John's school is giving back to the community. In 25 minutes, Zach Gowdy brings us the story of Brother Rice's Soup Club. Well, Husky Energy has provided an update on the oil spill at the White Rose Field. It says there have been nine observation flights so far and no signs of any oil sheens. There are six vessels on the water searching and they've had remote operated vehicles or ROVs checking out beneath the surface since Monday. So far, they've recovered 18 birds with oil on them. Three of those are being brought to shore. Two are being treated and one has already died. Let's uh, turn our attention now to uh, our first look at the weather. Ashley, it was uh, was kind of drizzly out there this afternoon. It changed for quite a bit from the morning. Yeah, drizzly here and lots of snow along the west coast and up through the northern peninsula. And cold temperatures are on the way. So if we take a look at the setup, we've got uh, the coldest air in North America is actually sitting over or was sitting over uh, the maritime provinces earlier today, leading to cold numerous cold temperatures uh, for this time of year. Now that area of uh, uh, area of cold is going to move towards uh, the province as we head through the night tonight. Now these colder temperatures are leading to the snow squalls that are going to happen over the next 24 to 36 hours. Significant snowfall expected. We've even got some blizzard warnings along the west coast and up uh, towards Labrador as well. I'll have all those details, tell you how much snow is on the way coming up. Thanks, Ashley. The town of Wabush says its rec complex is shutting down in the new year. The Mike Adam Recreation Center is closing because it's too expensive to operate. Mayor Ron Barron says it costs just under a million dollars a year to keep the doors open. That's about 25% of the town's entire budget. The 50-year-old building houses the region's only swimming pool. Last year, Labrador City and two mining companies chipped in on operating costs, but there's no deal for 2019. Well, there's a chance that your Christmas presents just might arrive at their destination in time for the holidays after all. The federal government is getting involved in the Canada Post dispute. Negotiated agreements are always the best solution. We wouldn't come down this road. However, we have exhausted every option. The Liberal government tabled a bill inside the House of Commons to force Canada Post employees back to work. But the federal government remains optimistic that a deal can be struck before it steps in. Canada Post is in its fifth week of rotating strikes by thousands of unionized workers. And with no sign yet of a breakthrough in contract negotiations, the union that represents mail carriers is furious. It's accused the government of violating workers' rights and it's promising to fight the back-to-work legislation in court. As our country's primary postal operator, Canadians and Canadian businesses rely on Canada Post. Canada Post and the Canadian Union of Postal Workers provide postal services, which again are of vital importance to Canadians and to Canadian businesses. Older Canadians, persons with disabilities, low-income earners, as well as Canadians living in rural, remote and northern areas who rely on physical mail delivery, including Indigenous peoples, are disproportionately affected during postal strikes. Well, from the House of Commons to the House of Assembly now, the Progressive Conservatives are asking the Auditor General to step in and investigate the government's relationship with Canopy Growth. 
The marijuana company is building a facility in the east end of St. John's and is getting $40 million in various breaks from the province in exchange for a 20-year supply guarantee. There have been questions about whether Canopy's owners have ties to the Liberal Party. The Tories want to know if the contract was awarded fairly. Now, the government says it's open to the Auditor General if the office chooses to investigate. Our officials have conducted themselves in an appropriate manner. We've done performance contracts before in other programs that we've offered in other business dealings. We have a good contract with Canopy. If the AG under a confidentiality, a confidentiality privilege or can get access and do her review when she comes back and said, I've looked at all of this, I'm confident that the agreement was struck, everything's been honored here, I'm comfortable with the $40 million in tax credit, how it's going to flow, I'm confident it's going to flow to the proponent and nobody else. If that report comes back and that's her findings, we're happy with that. Apparently, young people in St. John's are planning a massive party for Friday night. So large, the police have issued a warning to parents. The RNC says the party has been dubbed Project X on social media. It's planned for somewhere in the east end of St. John's. Police say people aged 14 to 25 have been invited, and it will include alcohol, weed, and other drugs. The RNC is urging parents to talk to their teens and be aware of what they're doing on social media. More than a year after a 13-year-old girl was killed in a rollover crash, her mother is demanding changes. Heidi Dunn was behind the wheel of a side-by-side -side vehicle in Bonavista, a machine that comes with lots of power but little regulation in Newfoundland and Labrador. Here now is Ryan Cook has this report as part of our series, Fatal Fun. It's a parent's worst nightmare. This little rock type thing. Mm -hmm. Something that was supposed to go on her grave, but it was too pretty. A glass case of mementos and a house full of her things. Possessions and memories are all that's left of Heidi Dunn. Everything <laughs> is still here. Yeah. We haven't gotten rid of anything. And that seems so bad, like it's such a thing to hoard. But how can you throw something away like that? Is it peaceful? Is it free like they say? The spitting image of her older sister Erica, the two were a dynamic singing duo. But now, Erica sings alone. Heidi was killed in a side-by-side -side crash in July of 2017. She was 13 years old, behind the wheel of her friend's parents' bike. She wasn't wearing a helmet. She was driving and it fell to the side and she... She hit her head. She hit her head and it was... Ollie had injury, and I've never read the police report, which I, pr I will never read it. I, I have no interest. I, I don't want to know the gruesome details. According to police, the owner of the side-by-side -side was ticketed for a penalty that carries a maximum fine of $200. I don't understand. It is a ticket for death. Heidi's death has helped shine a light on a loophole in Newfoundland and Labrador's legislation. The way an ATV is defined does not include a side-by-side. -side. As a result, there is no helmet law for side-by-sides. You don't have to wear a seat belt either. And while the legal age to drive an ATV is 16, you can drive a side-by-side -side at age 12 as long as you have the supervision of someone 16 or older. That's the only reason there was a ticket issued in Heidi Dunn's case. Service NL Minister Sherry Gambin Walsh says government is reviewing the legislation after a recommendation from the committee that reviews child deaths in this province. She says government is committed to making riders safer. Sherry Dunn believes a helmet could have saved her child and there'd be no need for this glass case of mementos. It's a promise they should keep and sooner than later. If it's later, God knows how many more children or adults could be injured, killed, but the sooner the better. It needs to be done. It needs to have been done three years ago. Erica will head to university next year and her mother will have an empty nest when she should have had another daughter in high school. 
Until then, the music and the memories will keep Heidi here. Ryan Cook, CBC News, Bonavista. After three decades... another frosty entrance for the Northern Ranger. Some came down. After three decades in service, the MV Northern Ranger is getting ready to retire. The vessel will pick up its last passengers in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And bring them to Black Tickle. Jacob Barker has a look back at the vessel's history. Welcome back once again. We're going to talk about the weather, but they had a bit of a time last night in Ottawa. Just have a look. Here's what a shed party looks like on Parliament Hill. Yeah, that's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau leading the band in a rousing version of the Ryans and the Pitmans. And the band, you'll notice if you're looking, you see Alan Hawko there, members of Rum Ragged, MPs from this province, you see Seamus O'Regan there. Video taken last night in Ottawa at a tourism event called the Newfoundland Shed Party. Apparently, MP Nick Whalen said on Twitter that Trudeau was the only one on stage who knew all of the words. Which is impressive and embarrassing. <laughs> 
Oh. He does look at him. He knows that he does oh, know yeah. the words. Singing it with gusto. Well, yeah. He's used to being, you know, yeah. in his previous life on stage yeah. and a Can performer. You see, Can you see <laughs> Seamus? Can you see Seamus on he's gonna start sort of like mouthing the words so <laughs> you know them? No, I didn't. I think he actually knows. Oh, <laughs> no, he knew he them. Knew. He knew them. <laughs> and you know all about the weather that's coming cold, hey? In yeah. parts of the province. Yeah, we're looking at some colder temperatures tomorrow. That's helping uh, with some snow squalls that we're going to develop as we head through the night tonight. But uh, today, full of snow along the west coast. If we take a look at the satellite radar from earlier today, uh, I was taking a look at the webcams earlier as well. Zero visibility up through the northern peninsula and then down through parts of uh, the west coast as well. And that will continue as we head through the night tonight. All of that rain now for the Avalon has pushed off. That's actually potentially going to be some flurries or even snow squalls as we head through the night tonight. So here's a look at those uh, warnings again along the west coast. We've got blizzard warnings. Things will really start to ramp up as we head through the night tonight. And then a snowfall warning for St. Anthony or rather the northern peninsula east. We are looking at about 15 centimeters of snow falling by the time at midnight rolls around. And then up through Labrador, we've got a number of blowing snow advisories and then a blizzard warning from Makovic to Hopedale as well. That's where most of the snow is actually going to fall over the next uh, at least through Saturday, we're going to see some significant snowfall expected. So here's a look at the setup right now. We've got all of that snow expected along the west coast uh, down through Buren and the Avalon. As I mentioned, we could see some snow squalls through the overnight. Pay attention to this snow heading towards Labrador. It starts to uh, heavy at times tomorrow afternoon and then continues through most of the day on Friday with all of that snow again along the west coast. We won't really see a break of this until at least Saturday rolls around for parts of the west coast. So here's a look at those temperatures. I mentioned that cold air moving in, uh, dipping down to the minus single digits again tonight, a uh, minus 11 along, along the straits. And again, down through parts of central could see minus eight, but flirting with the du minus double digits as we head through the night tonight. Those snow squalls will start to develop. Northwest winds 30, gusting 50, even 80 in some cases. And we're gonna see that up through uh, parts of Labrador as well. Cartwright's actually gonna see that temperature climb to about zero by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. So into the afternoon tomorrow, we're gonna hang on to these cold temperatures. So you're gonna wanna grab a warmer jacket as you head out the door tomorrow. Uh, about. 10 degrees below seasonal for this time of year, anywhere in the minus single digits for the most part. Again, those blizzard conditions really ramping up tomorrow along the west coast with gusts out of the northwest near 80 kilometers per hour. And then down through Marystown or parts of Buren and the Avalon, again, we're looking at that risk of snow squalls. That's the case through parts of Central as well. It's not quite sure where the snow is going to develop, but there is a, a chance we could see some uh, reduced visibilities through the day, anywhere from 5 to potentially 10 centimeters of snow is expected. Now, I mentioned those cold temperatures. That's actually prime for snow growth. So we could see these numbers. They're showing about 13 to 15 centimeters of snow could actually be doubled by the time uh, Saturday morning or even Saturday afternoon rolls around. Could see accumulations closer to 30 centimeters. And then uh, towards the rest of the uh, province, we're looking at between five to 10 centimeters. This is where most of that snowfall, as I mentioned, will be up through McCovic to Hopedale. This model showing upwards of 60 centimeters by the time Saturday morning rolls around. So a significant snowfall event with those blizzard conditions it just looks like a mess. But I'll have all those details coming, going and looking a, a little bit further ahead towards the weekend coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. The City of St. John's has launched a new 10-year affordable housing plan. The initiative aims to help people who are forced to spend more than 30% of their income on housing. The city says 12,000 households are spending that much or more to keep a roof over their heads. The plan doesn't advocate building a specific number of housing units. Instead, councillors hope to work with stakeholders and the province to build partnerships. We did undertake extensive research to inform this strategy. That's based on a snapshot of current housing need. And we define affordable housing as housing which costs less than 30% of net income. And so with that in mind, a lot of people will sort of do the math on their own situations and realize that they may actually be in housing which is unaffordable. It's a really common situation for, pe for people to find themselves in. But because it's so common, it might not be something that people are aware of that catch-22 because that arrangement is not part of a homelessness count so we can applaud that we're making great 
strides forward in ending homelessness, and we are in many respects, but again, we have this chronic population that are not part of that count, that are really not part of the city strategy. Um, and so I fear that as we move into some really innovative uh, projects and, and new money, unless we understand what our current reality is, um, I fear that we could end up continuing to miss a segment of the population who really are at greatest risk of, of uh, remaining homeless. The cost of gas is down by two and a half cents a liter today. It is the sixth week in a row prices around the province have dropped. In the last month, the price of a liter of gas has decreased by about 20 cents. Diesel is down by about four cents a liter today. Furnace and stove oil decreased by about three cents a liter. No change in the price of propane. The MV Northern Ranger is ferrying passengers down the Labrador coast one last time. The ship has been serving Labrador for over 30 years and it's going to be replaced next season. A semi-frozen here and now's Jacob Barker is at the port in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Jacob, uh, you're a trooper. What can you tell us about what's going on with the ferry? Yeah, it is very cold down here, Anthony, and the boat actually is on weather delay. That's not abnormal at this time of year. But last night it was a blustery entrance for the Northern Ranger into the harbor for its last passenger run to Goose Bay. It's another frosty entrance for the Northern Ranger. Some came down just to see her off. Others are here as usual to pick family up. She's done her time, she's done her duties for the north, south coast for many years and said to her, go. This common sight along the Labrador coastline will be replaced next year. For many here, it's a ship filled with memories. Some good. So the speedboats actually used to come out from Square Islands and pick us up. We used to whack down the ladder of the boat. And we used to get rides out when our family was out there fishing in the summers. There's one actually, a dragonfly flew out of nowhere and landed on me one time. I actually got a picture of it. <laughs> Some, not so good. We were coming in and coming across and it was really rough sea one time and I was pregnant. Was sick as a dog and I can remember the captain coming down, make sure you're all right. And the only thing he could do to give me was a, 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 a wonderful garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> Aboard the boat, more memories and well wishes. In Nain, a large crowd and even a brass band came to say goodbye. It, it hits home and it just reminds us a little more that it is coming to an end. Uh, the people of Nain, uh, the farewell was, uh, we didn't expect it. I didn't know it was going to happen. It was uh, something that was uh, just uh, off the cuff for us. I don't know if they, if they planned it, but it was absolutely uh, something I'll never, I'll never forget and I'll carry with me in my, uh, my professional career for the rest of my life. But with the end in sight comes an uneasy sense as well. The contract for the ferry is changing hands. That's putting the crew out of work. I think uh, a lot of people are feeling uh, a little bit of uh, nervousness in their, in their belly because of the, um, the security of knowing that your, your occupation is going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it really has hit us all yet, but uh, it seems like as, wind, as things are winding down that uh, it's becoming a reality. Well, from here, the Northern Ranger will head to Black Tickle, where it will drop off its last few passengers. That's when it's able to get on its way after this weather hold. And then to Lewisport, where it will go into cargo mode. And the captain says they'll continue to deliver goods on the coast for as long as the uh, ice will allow them to. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Um, good cookies and cakes and stuff. And we've had students who've had to learn how to use a can opener and a vegetable peeler. And it's also like just a skill to have, just so you can cook for yourself, you know? Next, meet the kids who are cooking up a storm and giving back to the community. We'll introduce you to Soup Club.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Working in the kitchen isn't every teenager's idea of fun, but a group of junior high students in St. John's has discovered the joy of cooking and helping people who are in need. Here and Now, Zach Gowdy takes you to the Brother Rice Soup Club. This isn't home economics class. In fact, class is over and most students have gone home. But for these kids, the best part of the school day is just heating up. We're at the soup club right now in the home ec room in Brother Rice. So I just finished cooking up some food for here and we're about to mix it into the peas and corns. The students do it all. Chop the veggies, mash the potatoes, brown the ground beef. We're making a shepherd's pie with some, I think it's a cantaloupe fruit kebabs. The other time I was here we made um, uh, what was it, like pasta and chicken, and uh, today we're making shepherd's pie. Uh, is it delicious? It is. <laughs> Soup Club meets every Thursday after school. Sponsorships, fundraising, and donations pay for the groceries, but the students aren't making a feast for themselves. The food is served at the Street Reach Soup Kitchen, just hours after the students finish making it. So we started with soup, and now we've expanded from approximately eight students to 40. And instead of making just soup, we provide the patrons of Street Reach with a hot meal and a dessert every week. The good feeling of um, knowing that people who might not have had um, food for a long time will finally have a full, be a full belly, and it, it just warms my heart. A good feeling isn't all they're getting. They're also learning their way around a kitchen. I learned like how to like better ways to cook, uh, better ways to cut, and how to act, uh, hold stuff properly and stuff. I think a lot of it is um, being able to cook in a group of people and uh, learning to work under a time constraint instead of just doing it leisurely. It's also like just a skill to have, just so you can cook for yourself. You know, you don't have to go out to all those fast food restaurants. Like any good chef, the students take pride in their work. And like any well-run kitchen, they keep it clean. These kids even do the dishes. When the shepherd's pies are prepped, they're wheeled through the halls of Brother Rice out to the parking lot where the Street Reach crew are waiting. Thanks to the soup club, Street Reach offers a free meal at the Gower Street United Church every Thursday night. What they're providing us is something that like, our budget would never be able to provide for 100 people. Um, we were doing soup and sandwiches for years based on that, and now we're providing things like shepherd's pie, stir fries, lasagna, all kinds of like really hearty filling meals. And the people who get to enjoy these meals know where they came from. We tell them every week, they're like, who cooked it today? And we'll be like, Brother Rice Junior High did, it, did this one today. They are actually overwhelmed. Every week it's, you know, oh my God, this was so good. And can I bring some home? I need one second. They may run out of shepherd's pie, but there will be another hot meal next week and the week after that. But the food is just part of what's cooking at Soup Club. We are providing our students through this um, excellent opportunity to become those people who grow up and become giving members of our society. And when you look around at the students and what they're doing, you can't help but feel a smile in your heart, in your mind. It is just awesome. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. He's been called Canada's leading political satirist. And for years, Newfoundland's Rick Mercer delivered the goods for the last 15 of those on CBC Television's The Rick Mercer Report. But he surprised a whole lot of people when he decided to sign off for good last season. So what's he been up to? For one thing, he has a brand new book. And Rick Mercer joins me now. It's very nice to see you. It's very nice to be here. So how proud are you of this thing? I am very <laughs> proud of that book. I've done books before that have included rants. This is the, the best rants from 15 seasons. But also it's a look back and uh, there's a lot of storytelling about being on the road for 15 years. Uh, a lot of things that went right, a lot of things that went wrong and uh, just uh, a lot of stories about uh, being out there on the highway. You said some of your favorites. Can you give us one? There's a lot of different rants. Uh, 
one of the things that I found interesting going back and looking at all of them is the evolution of the rant. Originally, they were almost always about national politics, uh, often about uh, uh, what was going on in Ottawa, obviously, and uh, they were kind of inspired by, uh, they would come from an angry place or a place of frustration, and always with a comedic treatment. And then as I realized as time went on, they didn't always have to be about what was going on in Ottawa. They could be about something as 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 universal as the fact that Canadians don't know how to use escalators anymore or they or people are blocking intersections and doing it on purpose. And and then uh, as time went on, I realized they didn't have to be about subjects that were always uh, necessarily uh, could even be treated in a comedic way. You know, when Gord Downey from the Tragically Hip passed away, I think everyone of my generation certainly was thinking about Gord and so that week, that's what I ranted about. So there was a lot of evolution over the years. When you review the rants and you pick out those that you include in this book, I mean, what goes through your mind? Are you thinking back to the emotions you were feeling at the time, the politicians you might have been skewering? Well, what, what sometimes you forget. <laughs> you know, you, you go back and you go, oh, I forgot that they built a fence along the harbor, right, <laughs> that was, I'm, so, I'm angry again about that, or something you had forgotten. Oh, right, they got rid of the census, I forgot about that, now it's back, okay. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of emotions, yeah, when you look back at them. As you say, 15 years, uh, you were in the spotlight for all those years, and many before that, and now not so much, even though you're on a book tour. Mm -hmm. uh, any withdrawals from uh, looking at that camera and the red light goes on? And no, <laughs> not so much. I, you know, I miss the people that I worked with. One of the things that I'm the most proud of, because this doesn't happen a lot in television, is that the team that was with me on day one of the Mercer Report, they were there when we signed off after 15 years. A lot of things goes, you know, goes mm -hmm. right. A lot of things go wrong. You know, I, I flipped a car, we, we rolled a car, we almost hit two deer, we crashed a hot air balloon, we crashed a helicopter, kind of. That's just going to work. There was, <laughs> so there was a lot of things happening. That would bind people together, yeah, those yeah, experiences. Yeah, yeah. Band of brothers. <laughs> One of the things, of course, that uh, has been a passion of yours, uh, besides performing, is politics. Mm -hmm. What do you make of what's going on in the House of Assembly, especially with that bullying harassment? Well, with the bullying yeah. and the harassment, it's important to note that these issues are occurring in every workplace, everywhere in North America, if not the world. They are. But uh, legislatures, the Newfoundland legislature, no different uh, than many others, that there is just behavior that goes on that is just 100% completely unacceptable in any other workplace. You, know, you, you do not get yelled at or when you're, you're talking in your workplace, if people around you started going, oh, 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 it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable anywhere. And they do it on a regular basis. So their, their standards are completely different. So they have to get in line uh, with everyone else. And, uh, and they have to take a hard look at their own behavior. Speaking of behavior, you can't talk about <laughs> politics these days mm -hmm. without looking south of the border. What do you make of it all? Are you worried about where that country is going and the f effect on our country? Oh, I think everyone who is a keen observer or even a you know, casual observer of politics finds what's happening in the United States uh, alarming. I think, uh, uh, if anything, I hope it puts uh, puts an end to anyone ever saying, well, I don't vote because no matter who you vote for, all, it's all the same thing. You know, the result is always the same. I think in many ways it's given many politicians elsewhere in the world a free pass in many ways because no matter what they do, no one is really paying attention to them anymore because Donald Trump sucks all the oxygen out of the room. I just want to ask you finally, Rick, everybody wants to know what's next for you. You've been pretty coy about uh, your future plans. What's on the go? When I know, Debbie. <laughs> I will return to this seat and I will tell you. Uh, I really liked writing this book. I really liked the, the, the storytelling aspects. Uh, I'm not quite ready to write a memoir yet. Uh, I'll leave that to Alan Doyle and Mark Rich. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I really enjoyed that, so I'm looking forward to doing some more writing. And, uh, There's a federal and provincial election next year. Politics? For you? you know, I've always kind of had that sneaking you know, fantasy in the back of my mind because I love politics so much and I always thought, I always make it akin to uh, you know, someone who likes the, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs that someday the phone is going to ring and they're going to say, can you come in as the general manager? And you say, damn right, and I'll 
show them how it's done. So I've often had that secret fantasy, but I'm less interested in politics from that point of view now than I ever have. Rick Mercer, thank you so much. Thank you. He was in fine form today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I uh, just wanted to point out that he's at Chapters in St. John's tomorrow at oh, 7. Yeah. So there you get a book signed for Christmas. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine him in politics. He's had too much fun skewering them. He knows yeah. the last thing he wants is Mark Critch going after him as <laughs> exactly. he's an elected person, right? <laughs> What have we learned at the Muskrat so Falls Inquiry? CBC reporters Terry Roberts and Mark Quinn will be here to cut through the weeds and explain what really matters. Welcome back to Here and Now. We are well into the Muskrat Falls inquiry that started in Labrador last September. Hasn't always been easy though to follow the dense and sometimes technical information that's coming out at that inquiry. And that's certainly been the challenge for our CBC reporters, Terry Roberts and Mark Quinn. And we thought it'd be a good idea to find out more about what they've learned and they're here in the studio. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Hello. So maybe just a quick reminder, what, what is this all about? What's this inquiry looking at? Well, right now we're in the phase where we're looking at what happened before sanctions. So this period from September until December is looking at what happened before sanctions. So they're asking questions about uh, uh, what, what, how was the, what was the process for leading to choosing this option. They were looking at different options for which way to go. And right now they're looking at what were the options, how were they chosen, how were those decisions made to actually sanction the project in December of 2012. And they're also really looking at as well is that information that was presented to government mm -hmm. prior to sanctioning. How was that uh, information developed and what kind of scrutiny was given to that information? So what questions should we be asking as we watch all of this, this unfold? I think there are a few questions that are really key. And uh, you know, one of them, for example, is, is this in fact the least cost option? And that was what they were really looking at back then, and we're trying to determine that even now. Was this the cheapest way to go to get the power we need in the future? Right, can we right. afford it? Sure, and yeah. you know, they did, Nalcor did its analysis, they compared two options. There was the interconnection op option with Labrador, we all know it as Muskrat Falls, and the second option was maintaining the isolated island uh, grid as such as we have now. And they did this uh, cumulative present worth system where they calculate the, the, you know, the future cost of those both two options, right. and they came up with a, a figure that Muskrat Falls was more than two billion dollars cheaper than maintaining the isolated island option over a period of 
50 years. So that's why the Muskrat Falls was sanctioned. So when we start looking at why it costs this much, as much as it ended up costing, one of the issues that's come up recently has to do with the people's pay scales and how much they're earning. How relevant is that to this? Well, the Commissioner LeBlanc ruled on that. I mean, he was asked to rule on that, and he did rule that he felt that possibly it was relevant. So he asked for that information. But once it came out, uh, we spoke with people about that, and one of the people we spoke with was Dave Vardy, and he's been a long-time critic of this project. Right. And he actually thought it wasn't relevant. He said, we don't need to know the specifics of this. He didn't think it was relative. And he was actually surprised, in his words, at how little you know, some of these people were being paid. He thought they were pay being paid much more. Right. So this is with respect to Mr. Harrington. Mr. Harrington, right? exactly. Yeah, well, that's, that's why, where all this came from. He was fighting to prevent disclosure of his day rate. And of course, that's the thing that you, he's a consultant, he's a hired gun in this business, he goes around uh, doing these mega, mega projects. This, by the way, was his first ever hydro project. And so he was fighting in court to have uh, that information kept secret. And anyway, Judge LeBlanc this week said, uh, I don't care what's going on in court, the Inquiries Act take precedence, release your information. And it turns out he was being paid about $1,700 a day prior to sanctioning in uh, 2012. Right. That's now gone up to about $2,000 a day. Okay, now, unfortunately, none of us, I don't think, are in that tax bracket. <laughs> but the context, is that a lot or not? I, I don't, like, for executives for a mega project that's in the billions, is that unreasonable to get that as a pay? We were told it's not. We were told that, that you know, th that's why people were surprised. Some said they were surprised it was so low because mm -hmm. someone doing that position, the director, the project director of Muscat Falls, a, a now uh, a $12 billion project, uh, they thought they would be paid more. So they were surprised mm -hmm. at how much uh, he was actually being paid, Mr. Harrington. To look at this from, from the big picture point of view, what themes strike you as important? What's emerging from this? Well, I was thinking about this, I thought of really three, and maybe Terry can add to this, but I think the three that emerged for me were, has there been proper oversight? Did they scrutinize the information carefully? Was there independent uh, looks at the information that was out when they made the decision to go ahead with Muskrat Falls? Right. Um, secondly, there's been suggestions, questions raised that, that suggest that perhaps Nalcor was lowballing the estimate, that some people had an interest in going ahead, some people maybe had a bias who believed it was good, and sort of downplayed the negatives and overplayed the positives and lowballed the cost to estimates. And that's one theme that's emerged. And the third thing I thought was that um, there's been suggestions that, um, you know, one of the options was sort of pushed through. The option of interconnected island with the lines going to the mainland and Labrador and this Muscat Falls project, that was being promoted over the other options, perhaps too aggressively. And that's right, a bit that's, of favor favoritism. That's right? what's being suggested yeah. by some theme, of the questions. As a theme. Right. Terry? Well, one of the things that's uh, really emerged from my perspective is that. Uh, Nalcor, there were there was times during the testimony when Nalcor was described as a fiefdom, that the project was described as a runaway train, and that uh, this was a classic case of the tail wagging the dog. And we've had uh, some senior bureaucrats uh, actually raise some concerns about, you know, they were finding out things in the Department of Natural Resources uh, after, because Nalcor was going straight to the Premier's office, for example. Right. So that's raised a lot of questions. And mm -hmm. another theme for me was that $6.2 billion figure that was released at sanctioning in 2012. Well, that figure did not include any financing costs, which is another billion dollars. And we've also learned that that figure was uh, built on, uh, based on January 2012 dollars. No escalation in that, in those estimates, which, which one risk uh, expert said at the inquiry was the you know was a mistake. They should have been building those estimates based on based on an estimate, knowing that the project was going to be done over four to five years. Quick final question for you: From here to Christmas, uh, there are some high points coming up. What should we be watching for? Well, we've heard from some people who may not be public figures, but were very important in the project. Uh, a lot of people in the background, like maybe Paul Hamilton, for example, who's been very important, but people wouldn't know his name on the street. So we're getting into the people who people would know and who had a very key role in that decision to actually sanction this project in December of 2012. Uh, like Kathy Dunderdale, who was the premier at the time of sanction, like Jerome Kennedy, who was the Minister of Natural Resources at the mm -hmm. time of sanction. Who I'm looking forward to is Ed Martin. He's going to be five days on the witness stand, and a lot of the questions that have been posed to this point People have been saying, yep, look, we kept sending that information to the gatekeeper. Now, who was the gatekeeper? That was former Nalcor CEO Ed Martin. So we're going to get a lot of information out of Mr. Martin. I've, uh, incidentally, he was around a lot during the first part of the inquiry in Labrador. He was there every day, including when we got back here. He was around a lot doing interviews. We haven't seen him lately. Okay. Gentlemen, obviously lots to look forward to between now and Christmas. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, actually, yesterday I remembered your words this morning. Don't forget your raincoat, and uh, at least here in the Avalon, I'm really glad I brought it because I went out sort of mid-afternoon and it was pouring. Yeah, and tomorrow grab a warmer jacket. Mm -hmm. That's the plan because that colder air will move in tonight. Tomorrow, temperature is well below seasonal, sitting in uh, the minus single digits for the most part. But the snow squalls will be the story tomorrow, and they're going to continue as we head through the night on uh, Friday night into Saturday morning, especially along the west coast. But we could see that potential for Buren and the Avalon into uh, Saturday as well. Now models aren't uh, agreeing 100% on where that uh, those snow squalls will develop, but it does look like uh, that is possible through the day on Saturday. Uh, certainly continuing along the west coast and again these accumulations are going to be quite significant for the most part into uh, Saturday for as far as snowfall goes. We're going to see uh, anywhere between Likely a trace to five centimeters is a good bet through central and eastern Newfoundland Th towards the Buren and the southern parts of the Avalon. We could see that potential to see between five to 10 centimeters in those squalls. Again, it is uh, dependent on where those squalls will develop on Saturday. So here's a look at the forecast. Those temperatures still quite chilly in the minus single digits for the most part. Again, windy conditions expected. So blowing snow and reduced visibilities along the west coast is possible. And then those temperatures hovering in the minus single digits up through Labrador, a little cooler in Lab City, sitting around minus nine. Now looking ahead, we are going to see these cooler temperatures continue for the most part right through into Sunday afternoon. It's looking more and more likely that we could see some flurries develop across the uh, central portions, at least the northeast coast and then down through the Avalon as well. And then into Monday, we could see a little bit of a change in the pattern, which means we could see some showers develop into uh, Tuesday afternoon as well. So here's a look at the long range forecast. Uh, snow squalls possible tomorrow. Gusty winds, as I mentioned, right through Saturday. Sunday looks like those winds will pick up, but not till later on in the day. That chance of flurries hovering around one degree. It's not too bad for the Santa Claus parade. Monday warm up at around three degrees. It's still uh, sitting around seasonal for this time of year. And then Tuesday, that chance of flurries, but not until the evening hours as those temperatures drop. Now for central portions of the island, we're looking at that flurry activity right through to Saturday, Sunday, more of a mix of sun and cloud. And then again, that chance of flurries dropping again on Monday, but then warming right up on Tuesday with that potential for flurries, but not until later on in the afternoon. Uh, Western Newfoundland, same thing. Again, blizzard conditions tomorrow, windy and blowing snow continuing on Saturday. Towards Monday, we're looking at a temperature near five degrees. For Labrador, uh, rain or snow by the time Sunday rolls around. Look at that temperature, five degrees with those warm temperatures continuing through next week and then uh, cold through parts of Western Labrador as well tomorrow and then warming up quite nicely as we head towards Tuesday. Now, uh, gonna take a little bit of a look, look at, at your weather one. photo today. Look at this shot. I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, that's a light pillar. Which wow. is, uh, yeah, just, well, I'm is not going to tell you where it is, but. Oh, this is uh, part of the Newfoundland Labrador space program. It's been, uh, <laughs> it's been top secret, the rocket launch pad of the Northern Peninsula, I believe. Yeah. Now, well, you're close to the Northern Peninsula. You're absolutely okay. right. <laughs> that was a lucky guess. I'll have, uh, tell you where it is coming up after the break. <laughs>
So let's find out. You're, you were close, apparently. Yeah, Ashley. Northern Peninsula. Where's our picture from? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's on the picture. I don't know, it was just funny before the break. Uh, it is the Apollo uh, Ferry. See, I told you the space program yeah, was involved somehow. Yeah, you were close. Somehow. You were very close. Yeah, it's Rob French uh, sent us this beautiful shot. He, well, what is it? He was on, it's a light pillar. It's the I've sun. I've never heard it's a of sunset. that. Okay, so what it is is um, in the atmosphere, you've got uh, ap the crystals, and then depending on how they are, mm -hmm. um, they produce that. With the light shining through. <laughs> Crystal clear now, thank you, I know. Ashley. Well, yeah, that's what it is. It's I've refraction, essentially. Refraction, yeah. okay. Oh. Well, we've got 30 seconds left, so do you want to explain refraction in the universe? <laughs> um, no, anyhow, but I can tell you. It's beautiful. Yeah, uh, if you have any weather photos just as beautiful as that, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. <laughs> we'll have another one for you. Mm -hmm. Ashley, we'll have another one mm -hmm. for you tomorrow night. We'll all be back here. Hope you will be, too. Have a great night. <laughs> Good night.